I continue to read the biography of Isaiah Berlin, chapter twelve, the second part. At the end of the war, there were new pressures forcing him to choose between his Jewish and British identities. Jews were flooding out of refugee camps to Palestine. Underground groups were waging open war on the British Mandate authorities there. When the Attlee government attempted to continue the pre-war restrictions on Jewish immigration, when it turned away ships containing desperate European refugees, British Jews felt their own loyalties began to come apart. By 1946, Westman's long-standing Anglophilia stood exposed as a bankrupt. Political momentum was in the hands of those who had taken up the gun. On twenty second July nineteen forty six, Jewish underground units, commanded by Menachem Begin, blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which、uh, hosted the British administration, killing ninety one people. Westman struggled. In vain to halt the tide of、uh, Jewish terrorism, he consulted Isaiah over the speech he was to give at the Zionist Congress at、uh, Basel in December 1946. And the Jews contributed a strong paragraph condemning Jewish terror. Terrorism insults our history. It mocks the ideals for which a Jewish society must stand. It contaminates our banner. It compromises our appeal to the world's liberal conscience. End quote. Westman commented to his、uh, associate, Mayor Wiesgau, quote, "Isaiah's paragraph about terrorism has some punch, hasn't it?" End quote. But the speech did nothing to retrieve. Westman's political authority. By the conclusion of the Congress, he had been stripped off of、uh, his leadership of the Jewish agency and cast into the wilderness. Enraged and rejected, the aging, near blind Westman dreamed of leading a ramp of moderate followers, Isaiah included, out of the moment. This came to nothing, and Ben. Gorian's associates in the Jewish agency began seeking to draw Isaiah into their camp. In January 1947, he received a call from、uh, Moshe Shatok, a senior official in the Jewish agency, offering him the direction of the agency's work in Eastern and Central Europe. Shatok was、uh, seeking to draw able Westman. Uh, nets away from the chief, but Isaiah refused to be seduced. By the summer of a nineteen forty seven, four thousand Jewish underground fighters had pinned down eighty thousand British troops. Dug into fortified command posts known as、uh, Bavanegras, after the foreign minister Ernst Bavan. Westman commanded Berlin to visit him. In late July 1947, Berlin unwillingly set sail for Palestine in company with his father. On the voyage, he was、uh, irritated by Mendel's constant need for company, but for the first time he saw his father, then sixty-four. With the detachment that comes from at last achieving adulthood himself, as he wrote to his mother, he had thrown a tent over both of their lives, so the Mendel had remained protected from life, amicable,、uh, amiable, kindly, decent, and innocent, a man with a.、Uh, No natural bristles, Mendel, for his part, wrote home, commenting sadly on the gulf between them. Mary wrote back from Baden, where 
she was、uh, taking the waters to say rather wisely that such a gap was natural. All the same, she said he was、uh, still our shallow. At the boat, meandered from、uh, Marseille to Athens, from Alexandria to Haifa, Isaiah talked to the Jewish immigrants in steerage. British warships were turning back other vessels loaded with、uh, refugees, but these immigrants were among the small minority who had、uh, legal papers for Palestine. They. Were crammed below decks with only the most basic possessions, and had been pushed from one refugee camp to another before securing passage to Palestine. But、uh, they were now, he reported to his mother, within solution of all their moral problems and material as well. They are afraid neither of life nor death. What more can be said? When the boat finally docked in Haifa, the Jews on board would have been surprised to observe one of their own being met at the quay by the British Assistant District Commissioner, Lord Oxford, Isaiah's friend from Oxford days, and a armed British escort. Haifa itself was in a state of、uh, tension. Only weeks before, British. Marines had boarded the Exodus, a ship bound for Haifa, with a four thousand five hundred Jewish refugees on board. They had wrested the control of the ship from its defenders, towed it into the port of Haifa, and compelled the refugees to disembark, for forcible transfer back to the refugee camps in Germany. At the same time. Two British surgeons were found hanging in a eucalyptus grove in Nantanya, executed by a Jewish underground fighting force in retaliation for British executions of their own fighters. The British and the Jews were at war, and here was a Berlin journeying south from Haifa in a British official car. To stay with、uh, Westman, the atmosphere was so tense that、uh, when he arrived in Westman's hometown and asked directions to the chief's house, one Rohavod resident he questioned looked at him in the eye and said coolly, "No idea." Even Jews in his hometown loathed Westman for his、uh, willingness to talk to the British. Indeed. These talks continued while Isaiah was staying in Rohavod. The British military governor of the local district dined with the Westman, and the、uh, local Haganah detachment demined the road for the governor's arrival, and then reminded it when he departed. Westman, nearly blind by now. Blundered about his、uh, walled garden, raging against the stupidity of the British and the folly of his、uh, fellow Jews, he had、uh, just given another speech, imploring his people to put their trust in the British, only to be hissed at for his pains. Isaiah asked him why he had gone so far, and the wise man shot back, "Everyone in this country goes too far." I don't see why I shouldn't. He begged Isaiah to leave Oxford, to cease teaching Gentiles and take up his、uh, rightful place as his、uh, chief of staff. But Isaiah was、uh, shrewd enough to see how things really were. There was no staff to be chief of. When Berlin turned him down, Westman was、uh, furious. He couldn't understand how a Jew could prefer to remain in the diaspora when the fate of the homeland hung in the balance. Isaiah remembers him muttering, "Your friend Felix Frankfurter sits there among those Gentiles. 
seven days a week. How can he? What is he doing? In letters to Frankfurter, Berlin confided that Westman had become a huge, bitter, tragic ruin. A man all his life wedded to power, now stripped of it, most remorselessly. Berlin felt sure that he should not give up Oxford for a career in Palestine. Jewish politics were too sharply polarized. He feared he would be torn to pieces. He also realized that he had no place there. The emerging Israeli society was a Middle Eastern, Hebrew-speaking, and instinctively anti-British. The Zionist project was creating a kind of a Jew with whom he had nothing in common. In the Kibbutzim in Galilee, he met brown-skinned Mediterranean people who looked like the Cypriots or Maltese, untroubled, unpolished, and unafraid. The chiasm between these Severus and the European Jews was, ab- was bound to grow. There is an irony in all of this. A lifelong Zionist discovering that he had no place in Zion. With uh, some relief, Isaiah excused himself from the Westmans and went to Jerusalem to visit Aunt Ida Samanov and other members of the Berlin clan. One of them was in a thick of the struggle for independence. His uncle by marriage, Isaac Landerberg, had fled Russia for Palestine in the early 1920s, changed his name to Yazak Sada, and uh, was now a Jewish underground fighter living in Tel Aviv on the run from the British authorities. Having fought the French Vachet forces in Lebanon and Syria on the British side on, in 1943, he had become one of the architects of the Palmark, the elite strike force of the underground Jewish army. While not personally involved in terrorism, Sadat was an enthusiastic advocate of direct military action against the British. Berlin ought to have disappeared, but uh, he was uh, captivated by Big Isaac, as the British had called him, so obviously one of life's irregulars. The slender, elegant, and rather wee man whom Isaiah remembered from a Petrograd was now plump, bearded, and uh, unkempt but as cheerful as ever and uh, enthralled by the dangers of an underground existence. They met in a back street cafe in Tel Aviv. Isaiah worried that someone in the cafe might tip off the British authorities. But Yazak laughed off the risks. He had no feeling against the British, he said. He even admired British uh, uh, institutions. But the most colonial administrators were frightful Philistines. It was impossible to talk to them about the books, ideas, music, or history. Submission to Arab rule, which was uh, clearly what the colonial office had in mind, was unthinkable. Isaiah came away from Sada and from Palestine, convinced that partition and independence had become inevitable and that he belonged back in England. The British announced that they were handing the Palestine problem over to the UN, and the UN decided in November 1947 on partition. The Jews accepted the petition, while the Arabs rejected it. And both sides inside Palestine prepared for war as the British departed. Palestinian Arabs began fleeing 
driven out by massacres and reprisals. On 14 May 1948, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the independence of the state of Israel. And Syrian, Lebanese, and Egyptian forces attacked while the British trained and armed Arab legion crossed Jordan and laid siege to Jerusalem. Jews around the world believed that the British, having abandoned Palestine, had sided with Arabs. On 6 June 1948, as the fate of Jerusalem hung on in the balance, Isaiah wrote to congratulate Wiseman on his election as Israel's first president and furiously criticized the British complicity in the attack on the new state. He told Wiseman that uh, the Foreign Office had persuaded themselves that a Jewish state must be crushed before it uh, falls within the Soviet orbit ideologically and politically. He ended by offering to approach Winston Churchill, then leader of the opposition, to urge him to mount an attack on the liberal government's policy. Westman wrote back with a sovereign calm to say that Churchill should not be disturbed. But then, of course, even Westman could see that the old Zionist strategy of uh, whispering in the ears of uh, symp sympathetic British politicians was uh, useless. Now the fate of uh, Israel depended on the force of his arms and on figures like uh, Yazak Sada, who were at this moment leading units of uh, Paul Mark against the Egyptian command posts in the Najif and the Sinai deserts. As the young state struggled for survival, Isaiah continued to feel occasional qualms of conscience about his detachment. The siege of Jerusalem continued through the summer of 1948, and he contacted Leo Amory, uh, our source colleague and former colonial secretary to see whether pressure could be put on the Arab governments to relax their grip on the city. In September 1948, with uh, Israel gaining the upper hand in its uh, fight to survive, Isaiah wrote to Westman making it clear that uh, while he would always remain a Zionist, he would not align his life with the new state. He said he would uh, never turn his back on Israel and insisted that his association with the wise man gave him more pride than anything else. He acknowledged that to choose Oxford in an hour of a crisis for our own people may seem unpardonable egoism and even a kind of a levity. But if uh, he did not settle down and do some serious work, I should become worthless in my own eyes. This letter was both his most uh, passionate declaration of allegiance and uh, simultaneously a uh, declaration of independence from Westman, from Israel, and from Zionism. Over the next three years, as the state of Israel took shape, Ben Gurion himself and the senior officials like Abba Eben, Ted Kolak, and Walter Etten were to plead with him to come and live in Israel. Westman was both gracious and shrewd enough to relinquish his hold, but his wife Vera refused to let go so easily. As late as 1951, she was uh, still imploring Isaiah to settle in Israel, but he had begun to detach himself from Westman's orbit after 1948. While he continued to visit the chief whenever he came to rest and recuperate in Switzerland, 
he found his visits to the old monster ever more difficult. Westman lived for power and hated the marginalized, purely ceremonial character of his office. Abba Elvin told Isaiah that when he visited Westman and asked him what he was doing, Westman growled, "Doing." I'm said to be the symbol of the state of Israel. I sit here and symbolize. When Berlin visited him again in 1950, he was still the king of the Jews, still the scathing observer of the follies of a lesser man. Yet there was a pathos about him now and a bitterness that made their encounters painful. He was now, Isaiah said. Like a sick old lion, when Vera Westman proposed that Isaiah become her husband's biographer, Isaiah delicately excused himself. After staying with Westman at Rehovot, it was a relief to look up Yosef Sada again. He was、uh, living in a small house in Jaffa, decorated with a.、Uh, Trophies of his battles with the Egyptians in the War of Independence, helmets, flags, daggers, and、uh, in a prominent position in the room, a large bottle of vodka, a gift from the Soviet ambassador. He was living with a sniperette, a partition fighter of the nineteen forty eight war. There were photographs of him. With his、uh, arms around his、uh, young protege, Marsh Danyan and、uh, Eagle Allen, and、uh, snapshots taken in captured Egyptian dugouts in the Najib, he was absolutely delighted when Isaiah called him a Jewish carabody. Isaiah loved Rab Yasahak's enthusiasm for the new Israel. But did not share it himself, as he wrote to Felix Frankfurter, the trouble about the Israelis is not only their partly unconscious conviction born of experience that、uh, virtue always loses and only toughness pays, but a great provincialism and a blindness to outside opinion. It is doubtful that、uh, Israelis ever knew how disparaging he was in private about a state that he defended in public. Would Ben Gurion, for example, have、uh, continued to seek Isaiah's company whenever he was in England, as he did in December nineteen fifty? Had he no more special? A、uh, skeptical Isaiah actually was. The prime minister arrived incognito, with his、uh, bodyguards, prowled about the bookshops, and then spent the evening at the meter, drinking tumblers of a port, and excitedly discussing everything from Plato's philosophy to the toll of a、uh, significance, signif- significance, of a.、Uh, Elephants in India fables. Van Gorin struck Isaiah as a vivid peasant leader, rough, ruthless, and cunning. He denounced Berlin's way of life and offered him the directorship of the Israeli Foreign Office, but Isaiah refused. Despite this, the Prime Minister considered using Isaiah as a secret go-between. With the Churchill in 1951, when the Israeli Prime Minister thought of approaching the British with the idea of a joint Caesar of Sinai from the Egyptians, the plan was a、uh, preposterous, and happily did not go much further than Ben Gurion's own mind. But the fact that he thought of Isaiah for the mission suggests how much, in the confidence of the Israeli leadership. He then was. In a lecture on Israel to the Anglo 
Israel Association in 1953, Berlin praised the country because it allowed Jews to escape their stereotypes and escape their history. They no longer had to be sophisticated, chess playing, cafe intellectuals. After history of a martyrdom, they had earned the right to normality, wholesomeness, and even dullness. If the Israelis did not wish to spend their lives in mourning for the six million Jewish dead, that too was their right. They would never. Forget the Holocaust, but neither were they required to live their lives as gloomy heirs of a black tragedy. When Weizmann died in November 1952, Vera sent Isaiah a heartbroken account of her, her husband's final hours, and soon afterwards redoubled her demands that he become his biographer. Isaiah duly contributed an obituary to the Times, but privately he confessed that the chief had been too ruthless and large-scale, and too public-minded with too little private life to be good. Publicly, he praised the Westman as the first totally free Jew of the modern world. If Westman's death finally resolved the issue. Of whether to embrace a Zionist career, it did not resolve the question of how to live as a Jew within British society. The creation of the State of Israel changed the nature of the question. In May 1950, the anti-communist writer Arthur Kostler, famous for Darkness at Noon. Gave an interview to the Jewish Chronicle, in which he argued that the Jews in the diaspora had only two possible choices: either to assimilate fully and discard their Jewishness, or to emigrate and lead a fully Jewish life in Israel. Anything in between was a farce. This was a direct challenge to Isaiah's own position. And he decided to confront Kostler's arguments head-on. His essay "Jewish Slavery and Emancipation" was published in the Jewish Chronicle in the autumn of 1951. Until Israel existed, Berlin argued, no Jew was free to live a purely Jewish life, undeformed by the scrutiny, pressure. And the repression of non-Jews, the creation of the state of Israel was a victory for freedom, precisely because it restored to Jews not merely their personal dignity and status as human beings, but what is vastly more important, their right to choose as individuals how they shall live. But this did not mean that the only free life. For a Jew, had to be lived in Israel. Kostler's either-or choice of assimilation or immigration was an exercise in intellectual bullying. There are too many individuals in the world who do not choose to see life in the form of radical choices between one course and another, and whom we do not condemn for this reason. Quote, After the Crooked timber of humanity," end quote, said a great philosopher. Quote, "No straight thing was ever made." End quote. Jews should have the same right to fashion their own lives as any other people, to choose assimilation, immigration, separation, any option that met the test of a self-chosen life. Berlin's.、Uh, Zionism was a defense of Israel as the necessary condition, and not for Jewish belonging, but for Jewish freedom. Berlin denied that、uh, there had to be only one way to live a Jewish life. Religious Jews believed that the preservation of Judaism as a faith was an absolute obligation. <laughs> 
to which everything else must be sacrificed. Equally, most secular Jews believed that the preservation of Jewish values might be worth any sacrifice. Still, others might well ask themselves whether the survival of Judaism over the millennia justified the unbelievable cost in blood and tears. Had the Jews assimilated successfully? Had they disappeared completely as a distinct people and religion? They might have been spared their martyrdom. Isaiah never believed that a total assimilation was possible, but the point was: How could Jews be sure that such an alternative might not have been better for them? For him, a、uh, Avishai Margalit remarked, "Jewish suffering could never be a blessing; it was always a curse." There was a area chill in the way he. Imagine that it might have been better to assimilate and disappear, than survive and suffer. But、uh, he was one of、uh, those Jews who, as he remarked of a、uh, Prost, turns his very rootlessness into the kind of a、uh, Archimedean point outside all the worlds, the better to assess them from. Because he was able to question his own commitments, he could see that the core values of others might be contestable. What one person valued, another would reject. Key values, freedom and belonging, were in conflict. These、uh, central conclusions were hammered out in his relation to his own Jewishness. One Jew would find his identity in Israel, another in Britain. One would find it in religious faith, another in keeping to Jewish customs, and still another in abandoning Judaism altogether. It was a form of intellectual tyranny to suppose that one of these choices must be right for everyone. What the claims. Of a religion and a tradition to prevail over an individual's right to shape his life as he wished, Jews would only substitute the self-imposed slavery of their own community for the gentle imposed slavery they had endured for millennia. Jewish slavery and emancipation was also a、uh, un. Sparing portrait of his inner experience as a Jew in Gentile society, a Jew, he said, was like a anthropologist studying a tribe. He could only prosper if he made himself more of an expert on the customs of the tribes than the natives. Hence, the poignant passion of the Jew for institutions. That admit him, but do not allow him truly to belong. Hence, the fanta- fan- fantastic、uh, over development of their faculties for detecting trends and discriminating shades and the hues of、uh, changing individual and social situations, often before they are noticed anywhere else. End quote. His own social success was due to exactly such a finely tuned radar. Now he could see that、uh, these sensitivities were something of a, a deformation, for they made him too eager for gentle approval, and this in itself built up a dialectic of, reje- of rejection. The more sensitive he became, the more his、uh, self. Consciousness stuck out. The more he lay himself open to exclusion and rejection. Another metaphor in the essay captured the inner essence of his experience of Jewishness in even starker terms. He liked telling a joke about a hunchbacked American inventor named Santa Mizzo. 
who was a walking past Temple Emmanuel Synagogue on Fifth Avenue in New York, with a Otto Kahn, a financier, who, though Jewish by origin, had thoroughly assimilated. Kahn looked up at the synagogue and said, "I used to attend a service there." To which a sentiment tartly replied. And I used to be a hunchback. This story must have been the basis for a long passage in Jewish slavery, in which Berlin argued that being a Jew was like having a hunchback. Each Jew reacted differently to his hump. Some pretended they had no hump at all. Others gloried in their humps. And showed them to all the world, while a third group, timid and respectful cripples, wore voluminous cloaks to conceal their deformed contours. The hunchback metaphor makes uneasy reading. It says something for the complexity of his inner life that the Berlin should have made such. Subliminal connections between Jewishness and deformity, and yet openly declared his Jewishness to the end of his days. A Jewish colleague at All Souls, Kais Joseph, later a minister in Mr. Mrs. Sacho's administration, reproached him for publishing the Hunchback passage. Jews may think such thoughts, but uttering them at Was a betrayal of the tribe. Berlin now felt embarrassed about his candor. He never allowed the republication of、uh, Jewish slavery and、uh, emancipation, and it remains hidden in a forgotten phrased craft. A word that I don't know. The essay had one important、uh, sequel. In it. Isaiah had made a glancing reference to T. S. Eliot, including him as one of those fearful thinkers, those souls filled with terror, who sought to place Jews beyond the borders of the city, because their critical and discontented spirit jeopardized the unity of a European Christian civilization. This critical reference to Eliot. Was somewhat surprising, since Isaiah had known the poet since the early nineteen thirties, admired him deeply as a poet, and had written for Eliot's quarterly magazine Criterion. After the war, Eliot had occasionally consulted him on philosophical manuscripts sent in to Faber. In December nineteen forty eight. Eliot had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Berlin's view of Eliot changed as controversy about the poet's opinions began to emerge. In 1950s, Emanuel Litvinov, a Jewish poet and man of letters, read to a London audience, which included Eliot and Stephen Spender, a poem. Entitled "To T. S. Eliot," which took the poet to task for his references to the Jewish people. After Litvinov had finished reading his work, Stephen Spender rose to defend his friend against the accusations of anti-Semitism. Eliot himself, his head bowed, was heard to mutter. Is a good poem, a very good poem. Thus, a controversy about the exact nature of Eliot's opinions was already underway when the editor of the Jewish Chronicle sent Eliot a copy of Jewish Slavery and Emancipation after it appeared in its pages in October nineteen fifty one. In a letter to Berlin in November nineteen fifty one. Eliot began by insisting that he had never advocated mass migration of the Jews out of the diaspora, and that for him the Jewish problem is not a racial problem at all, but a religious problem. 
Isaiah would not let the matter drop. Was it not the case? He replied that in the lectures delivered at the University of Virginia in 1934 and later published as、uh, "After Strange Gods," Eliot had、uh, said that a modern society could not achieve cultural and spiritual unity so long as there were Jews in its midst. He quoted Eliot's words back to him. Reasons of a race and religion make any large number of free-thinking Jews undesirable. So much for Eliot's insistence that the race had nothing to do with the Jewish problem. After pointedly referring to the fact that these lectures were delivered a year after Hitler came to power, Isaiah accepted that. Eliot had never advocated methods of、uh, barbarism, but he went on, quote, "Am I profoundly mistaken if I think that, at any rate in 1934, you thought it a pity that large groups of free-thinking Jews should complicate the lives of otherwise fairly homogeneous Anglo-Saxon Christian communities?" And that it were better otherwise, and that if this could be done by human means and persuasion and without coercion, it would be better for such communities if their Jewish neighbors, or a sufficiently large proportion of them, were put beyond the borders of the city. End quote. Eliot's reply apologized for the. Dubious sentence in the 1934 Virginia lectures. Quote, the sentence of which you complain with justice would,、uh, of course, never have appeared at all at that time, if、uh, I had been aware of、uh, what was going to happen. Indeed, had already begun in Germany. I still do not understand why the word race occurs in the sentence. Because my emphasis was on the adjective, free thinking. Eliot was unwilling to abandon the word race altogether. There might be something in the idea of a racial inferiority and a superiority, after all. He said, if understood merely as a way of saying that some cultures and societies had proven more successful than others. But whether or not Jews were a race, they certainly were a culture, and in his view, cultures could not survive without a religious backbone. The key question, therefore, was whether Jewish religion could or should survive. Quote, From a Christian point of view, the Jewish faith is finished, because it finds its continuation in the Catholic faith. Theoretically, the only proper consumption is that all Jews should become Catholic Christians. The trouble is that this ought to have happened long ago, partly because of the stiff nakedness of your people, and largely, perhaps, chiefly, the apportionment is not immediately relevant because of the. Misbehavior of those who called themselves Christians. This did not happen. End quote. Secularization, Eliot went on, was unlikely to bring peace between Christian and Jews. If both discarded their faith, Jews could still be on the outside looking in, for the Gentile majority would always remain within a、uh, essentially. Christian culture, while the Jewish minority that abandons its religion would find no home within Christian culture. This is what my adjective "free thinking" implies. He continued, in a secular modern culture, the Jews were condemned to an eternity of alienation, discontent, and self-dislike. He concluded, quote. 
The only possibilities are that the Jews should maintain their own culture by maintaining their own religion, and I do not see why there should not be Jewish communities in a Western civilization, or else that they should be assimilated completely, affirming that the only real assimilation would be by acceptance of a Christianity. End quote. Berlin did not reply to this, but he had already indicated that in Jewish slavery, that the total assimilation, that is, abandonment of the Jewish faith, was impossible. So there was nothing more to say. Feeling that he did not want to associate Eliot with Costler's views and not wishing to offend the poet, Berlin removed our reference to Eliot in the version of the essay when it appeared in a Israeli fresh craft. Much later in life, he felt that uh, his apolitaness had shaded into obsequiousness. Beyond these uh, concessions to good manners, Berlin did not give a ground to the substance of the difference between them. The divide was not merely between a secular Jew and a believing Anglo-Catholic, but between a liberal individualist and a conservative with an abiding conviction that individualism was corroding European civilization. Isaiah's Jewishness made it as evident to him as it was to Eliot that individuals must have a secure cultural belonging if they are to be genuinely free. A Jew whose culture has vanished around him is no longer free to be a Jew. To this degree, he could share something with Eliot. He could see, as Eliot did, that individuals in modern societies were incorrigibly divided about the nature of the good and that the faiths men professed were in irremediable contention. In place of a cultural unity, there was now an irreducible conflict between competing human goods. For Eliot, this was a matter of regret. For Isaiah, an unchangeable fact about the modern world, indeed about the human life as such, and one that he was to make the central focus of his uh, later work. That's the end of uh, chapter 12. And uh, the last sentence uh, would tell us that uh, uh, we will start to read Berlin's political philosophy that I'm more interested in.